Today I'd like to talk about RF attenuators. And attenuators really serve three purposes in, uh, in RF measurement. One is they reduce the signal level, of course. That's what attenuator means. So if you need, if you have, for example, a uh, 10 dB uh, or 10 dBm level signal, and you need to reduce that to 0 dBm, well, you put a 10 dB attenuator in. Now, you may notice I said dBm versus dB, and I almost made the mistake of, of starting with a signal level in dB. There's really no such thing. Uh, dB is an always a ratio. If it has a little subscript after it, like M, then it's an absolute power level. So, a 0 dBm signal is a power level. 0 dB is simply a power ratio. I hope I'm not beating a dead horse here. Most of you probably already understand that. But the reason it can be important is a 10 dB attenuator reduces the power by 10 dB. So it doesn't matter what you put in on one side, you will get 10 dB less on the other side. Doesn't mean that if you put in a signal on one side, you'll get 10 dBm out on the other side. Some people misunderstand that. Uh, okay, so what I have here in front of me are basically uh, two different types of attenuators. On the left are fixed attenuators, on the right are what are called step attenuators or uh, adjustable attenuators. Now, this one is a vintage Hewlett Packard that goes to 120 uh, dB of attenuation. You'll notice it has SN, uh, BNC connectors. If you watched my video on RF connectors, you know that those really are only good to about 3 uh, gigahertz. And frankly, most people don't use them much above 1 gigahertz in, in uh, professional applications. Below it is a step attenuator that purports to go to, uh, I think it's 3 gigahertz. Let me see if I have the, well, I'll get the specs out in a minute. Uh, it doesn't. And that's another thing we're going to be talking about is how do you know your attenuator really attenuates the way, uh, the, in other words, how do you know the whether to trust the label? These are fixed attenuators. And the differences between this set, for example, and this set is the connector. Also, the frequency response. These are B and C, and therefore they're not intended to go above 3 gigahertz. These are SMA, and they are rated to 6 gigahertz, this particular set. And then down here are a couple more B and C attenuators. So what about this one? Well, this is a 10 watt attenuator. You may notice that unlike the rest of these, it uses an N connector. This is what an N connector looks like on the end, and of course that mates with this. So other than the connector, what else is special about it? Well, it can dissipate up to 10 watts continuously. In other words, it's a 30 dB attenuator. And it purports to go to 3 gigahertz. I have checked it. It does do that. And it says it's a 10 watt 30 dB attenuator. So what that means is that if you put this in line and you put a signal on one side, the signal on the other side will be 30 dB lower. And if the total amount of power being put into the input side, and by the way, these are symmetrical, you can turn them either way, is less than 10 watts, 
it will reduce that signal by 30 dB and will not get too hot, will not burn up. If I put 100 watts into this though, uh, it might last for a few minutes, but it probably won't last very long. And by the way, it doesn't matter what you put on this side, because remember that to, to create that 30 dB loss, you are turning that most of that power into heat. And the, the amount that's left, the, the 30 dB less of power, that is left at the other side is, is then absorbed or reflected. It's absorbed if there's a load on the other side that matches it. If there's not, it's reflected back into this and adds to the uh, power dissipated inside here. That's one reason you want to always match things so that you don't have that reflected power being absorbed inside your, uh, your device. Okay, that maybe is enough on uh, the basics of attenuators. The next thing I'd like to do is turn to how do you determine whether uh, you can believe the label? In other words, does the attenuator that you're using actually produce the level of attenuation as that's marked on it? And does it work across the frequency range that you that's marked on it? And third, does it properly match to the impedance of the circuit that you're working with because if you have a 75 ohm system and you use a 50 ohm attenuator you're going to find that your measurements are way off you'll have reflections it's just a mess so you always use an attenuator that matches the uh, frequency response gives you the amount of attenuation and uh, covers the frequency response you need. Now at the very beginning I said there were three purposes. One is to reduce the signal level and that's what we've talked about so far. But the second reason is to protect your equipment. So one reason that I have this 10 watt attenuator is so that I can hook this to a transmitter. And most HF transmitters these days you can turn the power down to 10 watts or less. So I can use this with most transmitters and of course most of the VHF handheld uh, units have a 5 watt or lower operating mode. So this allows me to reduce the power of a transmitter by 30 dB and therefore helps to protect my test equipment. And then the third uh, reason to use these is isolation. If you put a 30 dB attenuator between the signal source and the measurement source, then the effect of the measurement device on the signal itself is reduced by 30 dB. So it isolates the input from the output. And that helps, and also, of course, isolates the output from the input. That helps to produce a more accurate reading that isn't subject to all the reflections. So a minute ago I mentioned a 75 ohm system using 50 ohm attenuators. On the side where you're going, if you go into this with a 50 ohm uh, unit and then uh, driver, but then you have a 75 ohm load on this side, you will get reflections and what you try to measure out here will be subject to those reflections. However, those reflections will be reduced by 30 dB and will have far less effect on the generator. So, first, reduce the signal level. Second, protect your equipment. And third, provide isolation. Now let's see how we measure these attenuators. So first I'm going to set up the Rigol DSA815 and what I have done is connected a, that may be hard to see, maybe this one would be better. Yeah, it's a little better. I have connected an SMA cable from the tracking generator to the spectrum analyzer input. And you may notice it's a very short piece of cable and that's to, to uh, minimize 
the attenuation of the cable. Okay, let's now come over and look at the screen. And what I'm going to do is I have normalized the screen. I won't go through how you do that. It, it varies from one generator to another, for, from one spectrum analyzer to another. But this normalizing a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator is equivalent to calibrating a vector network analyzer if you're familiar with that concept. So here is the screen and the only thing different is I have reduced the reference level by to 90 percent so that it's not right up here against the top and it may be a little easier to see. So what normalization does, just like calibrating your VNA, is it establishes a series of points that that make up for or compensate the frequency differences in the instrument and in the in the cable you're using when you normalize. So now I'm going to connect up one of these attenuators. I'm going to use a 10 dB SMA attenuator to see what the frequency response looks like. Okay, you may notice I have now connected the attenuator. Let me show you that over here. And you may notice I've connected it on the tracking generator side so that the signal is, uh, so, so that I'm isolating as close to the tracking generator as possible. And then it goes through that same cable over to the spectrum analyzer. And we have a pretty flat line you zoom in a little bit more. But you see there are some wiggles. And no attenuator is perfectly flat. These are pretty good attenuators. They go out to about 6 gigahertz. But they're not anywhere near the best you can buy. These are reasonably priced. You can get a set of these for less than $100. Uh, really good attenuators, by that I mean lab quality, what are called metrology grade, can cost you more than a hundred dollars each. And and I paid less than a hundred for this whole set. So, okay you say, that's that's fine, it goes out to one and a half gigahertz. What if you wanted to go out to three gigahertz or what if you wanted to measure a step attenuator? Well let's start with the step attenuator because I'm now going to insert a uh, step attenuator in this path instead of this 10 dB and first check its frequency response and then we will uh, switch to the uh, uh, Siglent spectrum analyzer to check this uh, out to 3 gigahertz. Before I hook up the step attenuator I thought I would uh, point out something. Notice that this has a little bit uh, is not quite normalized and one of the reasons is to make it convenient to attach the step attenuator I've used a different set of cables. The step attenuator is has an SMA on each end and I want to put one end of the SMA on one end and one on the other so I'm using two cables now instead of one and there's a little uh, connector between the two and so what's important is that I renormalize the spectrum analyzer before I start trying to uh, before I insert the step attenuator so let's do that I'm going to turn normalize off and then I'm going to turn it back on and it will renormalize. And you may notice that it got much flatter. Now we can insert the step attenuator. Now I've inserted the step attenuator. See that over there. Using exactly the same cables. So right now the step attenuator is in place of the, the little uh, coupler that I was using earlier. 
notice that it does that it has some frequency anomalies in this the attenuator those are what you would call baseline anomalies in other words that doesn't depend on which uh, attenuation setting you have but in a step attenuator you have another anomaly that is associated with each uh, stage in the step attenuator. The part of the magic of and the cost of attenuators is in eliminating as many of those anomalies as possible. So let me give you an example. I'm going to insert 20 dB of attenuation and you see there. Then I'm going to take that out and assert insert 20 dB of attenuation from another place. Then I'm going to do 16 plus 4. Now those all may look the same to you and they are pretty close but there are minor differences in the frequency response. So let me show you on the attenuator what I was doing. This attenuator has a 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 uh, sequence and then three 20 dB attenuators they add up so if the this is 20 if you add this one you get 40 if you add this one you get 60 if you take this one away you're back to 40 and so on so what I was doing is this is 20 dB inserted with a 16 and a 4 this is 20 dB inserted with the, fir or the third 20 dB attenuator. This is 20 dB inserted with the middle and so on. So we want to determine whether there are any serious frequency anomalies in this uh, unit. But remember it's rated out to 3 gigahertz. So you're going to find that it's probably going to work pretty well over the range that we have the DSA 815 set for that is 0 to 1.5 gigahertz. So let's go over now and do some uh, tests on uh, the attenuators. First we'll use the, uh, the mini circuits uh, fixed attenuator and then we'll insert this same step attenuator and we will attempt to see how the frequency response changes particularly as we get into the higher frequency areas. Now we have switched to the Siglent SSA3032X. It's a 3.3 gigahertz spectrum analyzer with tracking generator. Once again, you notice that I have the tracking generator connected to the spectrum analyzer through a short SMA cable. And I have normalized just as before and I have reduced the uh, the reference level to 90% just as I did on the Rigol. So the only difference between these two is this is going from 0 to 3.3 gigahertz instead of 0 to 1.5 gigahertz as the Rigol was doing. So now let's insert that mini circuits 10 dB fixed attenuator. And here you see that we're starting to have show some uh, some larger anomalies as we get out into this region. Now remember this is one and a half gigahertz this is 3.3 gigahertz so this is about 3 gigahertz and at about 3 gigahertz it starts to show some uh, some changes. Now remember this is 10 dB per division and notice we do have 10 dB of attenuation we have we start at the reference level zero and we go down 10 dB so it works pretty well up to around 3 gigahertz and then we get variations and remember it's the peak to peak variations that will upset your measurement so maybe that's a half a dB up and a half a dB down but it's a total of 1 dB difference in what you will measure if you're just doing simple measurements and just trying to get something to work in your in your on your ham radio rig or something that's probably good enough but 
if I were having to submit these results to a customer or to a uh, uh, some kind of uh, convening authority like a paper or whatever, I'd want to try to eliminate those. And to do that, I'd need a better attenuator. So this is a really good mini circuits attenuator, but it's a really good low priced attenuator. Once again, metrology grade would cost me easily 10 to maybe 50 times as much for a good metrology grade attenuator. Okay, now let's insert the step attenuator and see how it works out to 3 gigahertz. Before I insert the step attenuator, once again, I have inserted those cables with the coupler and you may notice that out near 3 gigahertz I start to get considerable uh, frequency variation. So once again we need to renormalize. We're going to do that by turning normalize off and back on again and it renormalizes and now the effects of those cables and that coupler have been taken out. Now the, so now in place of the coupler I'm going to insert the step attenuator. Now I've inserted that same step attenuator and notice that it has some of the same issues out at uh, 3 gigahertz but it also has some other issues. One is, notice that it starts out with 10 dB of attenuation. Let me give it 8 and 2. And I, I'm sorry, that's 8 and 1. 8 and 2 should be 10 dB of attenuation, but it's not really 10 at the left. It is 10 toward the middle, though there are some anomalies. And then as we get out to around 3 gigahertz or a little above, it goes into that same uh, cycle. Now, I'm going to make sure that I have all the connectors tight and uh, so on. And then we're going to go back to the flat version. Once again, to establish the baseline of the attenuator, that is, to, to accommodate the cabling and the internal structure of the uh, attenuator itself, I'm going to renormalize and now I'm going to insert 10 dB. Notice now we get a fairly flat 10 dB of attenuation. Once again, when we get out to close to 3 gigahertz, we start getting anomalies. Now, you might say, okay, now let's see what, what happens when we put in 20. Looks pretty good. 40. Well, not quite so good. Not down to 40 here, and it certainly isn't 40 there. So let's put in 20 more. Okay, now it looks like it's only at 40 on the left, and I got 60 dB inserted. And on the right, it's only about 30 dB, about half of the setting. What's going on here? Well, two things are going on. I'm not going to go into the detail because I don't want this to be the world's longest video on attenuators. But one of the things that makes a difference is when you're trying to test levels of higher attenuation, you have to lower the noise floor of the signal analyzer, of the spectrum analyzer. And you do that a number of ways, including narrower uh, video and uh, resolution bandwidth. Uh, you may need a higher level from the tracking generator. You may need to turn off internal attenuators inside the spectrum analyzer. And you may need to turn on preamplifiers. A lot of different ideas there. As you become familiar with your spectrum analyzer and you work with these things, you, you can learn how to get a more accurate measure of devices at higher attenuation levels, which also, of course, mean at lower signal levels. I won't get into that, except to say that what we have found is that this uh, attenuator 
does not work, is not flat out to 3 gigahertz, but it is pretty good. And if you normalize, then your steps, so for example, let's go to back to 10 dB of attenuation, it's pretty close. But at the higher levels of attenuation, I would need to change many of the settings of the spectrum analyzer and the tracking generator in order to be able to read the uh, attenuation levels that this attenuator is capable of. Now, I won't show the, uh, the HP. It's a pretty good vintage piece of equipment, but in its day, it was relatively state-of-the-art for a, an affordable attenuator. They were still pretty expensive, but uh, for an affordable attenuator and one that would only go to, let's see, I think it says 1,000 megahertz. So the quality of the equipment you buy is only matters if it is matched by the quality of your understanding of these various concepts. So I hope what I've done is given you an introduction to how to use attenuators to reduce the signal level, to protect your equipment, and to isolate one stage from another. If I've accomplished that, then some of these nuances of how to reduce the anomalies in, at higher frequencies and how to go to levels of higher attenuation and so on, maybe we can do in a future video. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this. Stay safe. Have a nice day.